Whew, that took a little while for that to get started. How are you today? Good. I was going to say Wednesday is Sunday at Carvel, but today's Tuesday is Monday at No Vacancy. Oh, now I want to fudge you the well, Kate. Thanks. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the one and only No Vacancy Live. That's Anthony Melchiori. I'm Glenn Hausman. It is so great to see all of you with us today. Anthony, believe it or not, just last week, I had an urge for Carvel. And uh, I, I made my wife drive me to Carvel so I could eat the cone and not have to worry about driving home. It was, uh, if, it was, I could it was have a highlight. Cream, if I could have ice cream without winding up in the emergency room, I used to eat. Uh, ice cream cones with double chocolate sprinkles yeah. and then the double chocolate sprinkles. So anytime I ran out of chocolate sprinkles, I dip it in the cup. Uh -huh. and so, cause I'm a chocolate sprinkle guy. Yep. And uh, one of the only uh, freestanding car bells is in Co on Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn on mm -hmm. I think, actually Coney Island Avenue. And it's been there since literally I'm a baby since the day I was born. And right. um, it's one of the only freestanding Carvel. Remember the old looking Carvel shops? Of it's course. Yeah, we still have one on Route 25, that little standalone that, building. There's not many. There's like, no. clearly, I, I think there's a couple of handfuls and that's it. And it's funny, I walked in there the other, not the other day, but maybe last year for something. I was getting a birthday gift for somebody. And um, the same guys there. They're, they're, everybody's like, it right. looked like just 30 years ago. Wow. That's a. Yeah, that's freaking Carvel. All For right. For those people that don't know what we're talking about on the West Coast, Carvel is like an iconic ice cream shop in New York City on the East Coast. Right. Awesome. Well, um, uh, did I do that? You did, and that's kind of weird. I know. It is kind of weird. I'll put it back to our normal format. Sorry, everybody. I'm in a hotel room and the, com the computer is not really working uh, well for me today. Um, all right. So, Anthony, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, hospitality industry investment. But before we do that, and when we get these gentlemen on the show, we'll ask them about this. But um, Axios, uh, which is a great non-partial news site, it's just the facts, ma'am, kind of a thing. What I really like, um, they just put out an article uh, based on a survey done by the conference board, their big nonprofit uh, think tank um, focused on business. So it says executives are increasingly resigned to a world where employees don't come in every day as hybrid work arrangements, mixing work from home and in office are now the norm. About 20, 25 percent of workers in the U.S. will work at home for at least part of the week, according to data. Um, and that's a little bit below the 47 percent. But at the conference board, they're saying the battle is over. There are so many other issues CEOs are facing. What do you think? I, I think that's right. I don't think there's there's anything to add to that, that. That listen, it's you know it's back in the day, you had leverage. You have no mm -hmm. more leverage. COVID yep. took away the leverage because mm -hmm. the answer would be we can't be effective. Now COVID showed you can be highly effective working from home. So before you could use that excuse, and that was the, that's the reason everybody was in the mm -hmm. office. Right. Have to be and COVID proved that no, I still think like if I was running a company with fifty employees, I would mandate four days a week. And if you didn't want to work four days a week from the office, don't work for us. And if I couldn't get the employees to do that, then I would go to three. And if mm -hmm. I couldn't go to three, I go to two. If I couldn't go to two, I go to one. <laughs> if I couldn't go to one, we all be working from remote. Like, yeah. you know, that's nice, right? <laughs> hey, listen, I'm working remote today. I totally, I totally get it. So the reason why I bring this up is this is a constant trend uh, over the last number of years that we've been really addressing here, and I think it provides a certain amount of opportunities for people who are doing hospitality investments. And I think that's kind of a a good way to kick off our. We got two great guests Absolutely. today. Number one, we have Mr. Uh, Bob and Patel of Green Harvest Capital. They are a private real estate firm focused on acquiring and upgrading multifamily and real estate. It's also being joined by Meet Patel, who's uh, from Spark Hotels, um, and they're a privately held firm focusing on development, acquisition, and management of value-add hospitality assets. Gentlemen, it's so great to see you today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, for sure. All right. So... Um, 
Bavin, you guys have been out there. You've been deploying a whole lot of capital. When we first connected, it was something like $80 million over the, the last year with another $40 million to go. I'm sure some of that's been deployed. So let's get the big picture on how you are seeing the state on hospitality investment today. Yeah, no, thank you so much again for having us. Great to be on the show. <clears throat> And, you know, Glenn, we, we've been fortunate enough to deploy around 160 million over the last 12 months in some brands um, across the Midwest. And, you know, we're, we're seeing this, you know, from our perspective, this once in a generation shift, right? Um, property improvement plans were greatly deferred through the mm-hmm. pandemic for mom and pop operators and institutional players. There is a retirement trend with baby boomers of Indian origin in, in the hotel industry kind of retiring and coming mm-hmm. back point of, you know, hey, do, do I want a, a 15 year license extension with a two to $5 million PIP or is this a time that I sell? Right. And right, so right. I think that's the opportunity that we are capitalizing on. Um, we, we also see a tremendous opportunity to add technology to hospitality. And I think, you know, Marriott, Hilton, IHE, everybody's doing a great job uh, of connecting our hotels. And, and as we look at doing these property improvement plans, we're very much leaning into building out IoT devices and, and, and a cloud-based property management system. You know, I think Anthony made a great point about, yeah. you know, number of workers, right? I think we're all um, trying to understand over the next five to 10 years, how do we automate or optimize a lot of our operation, front office and back office? And, and how do we add that value so that we can drive a better number to our bottom line and, and deliver a better guest experience. So what we're really talking about here is a lot of different factors are happening. Opportunity is coming from uh, the older generation retiring, and then you almost having a clean slate from what to do with those properties, which helps you reposition them and reinvent them for a modern era with a modern uh, workforce that's going to do more with technology. So uh, Amit, you're working with uh, a company that's doing this joint venture with them. How do you see it? You know, from, from my perspective, the timing is everything. So our ability to capitalize on hotel assets that are obviously are going are going to be undergoing, undergoing a PIP, so it's a value mm-hmm. add play for us. So it's the basis that we go into these deals that really makes sense. And the timing was right for the last 12 months for us to transact um, across uh, you know, IG Hilton and Marriott properties in the Midwest, as well as Mid Atlantic and Northeast area, and and based on our relationships, right? We have a lot of relationships in the industry that we've mm-hmm. created with with major hotel groups, with franchisees, with brokers, and we re- and those relationships have cultivated into us being able to transact in a very tough debt environment, and 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 we need, and we did it really well, um, and I would say. It all comes down to the basis from our perspective, right? Going into the deal at a low basis, being a value add player, transforming the hotel around from not only from a PIP standpoint, from management management standpoint, and really coming out of it at, at a much value add play. When you say, if you could, because we have a lot of young people in college, when you say my cost basis, explain what our cost basis is so people that are as familiar as we are, what do you mean? It, it seems self-explanatory to them, but I just wanted to make sure that we're always teaching. Yeah, so in basic format, it, we, we look at things on a per room basis or a per key basis. And so when we analyze hotels, we look at it, we look at, for, we look at two things, right? We look at um, the multiple of revenue, right, that we can get into this deal. And then we look at the cap rate of each hotel and we kind of do a blend analysis and, and we look at how much, how much is, what is the ideal purchase price based on the per key basis? And, and then our basis according to what, whatever the market is maybe selling for or whatever, whatever the seller previously bought for, you know, maybe it was two, three years ago, pre pandemic. And we we're coming in at a price point that's more ideal, idealistic of what today's market transactions should be. And that basis is typically low based on obviously a revenue, mm-hmm. the, co- the running the current, like what looking at the trailing 12 of the P and L's and also looking at what replacement costs are. Right. Yeah. And so, and how do you manage that process when you're raising capital? Because you don't want to give away your hand for the price of the building, saying, I know how much upside there's a 10%, 20%, 30%. And you want to you want to build that in. But how do you negotiate that without, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, I do. Positions. Like, you know the, I upside, mean, yeah. you know the upside. 
It's like, I know it's worth 20 million, but really it's only worth 4 million, but you know, it's not. So how do you negotiate that? How do you work? How do you, how do you do, deal with that? Uh, Bob and I will use the word we use the word price discovery for sellers. Right. Um, <laughs> price price discovery. Love it. <laughs> and all yeah, this, on this show, we 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 just take the band-aid off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I mean price discovery. For realistic, Anthony, like price discovery really comes along the fact that debt markets really dictate. Yeah what pricing is in this that market. service coverage ratios drive most of the conversation for you right, right. If, if you can't cover a one two five wait explain that please to people yeah it purchase price over noi you know so like you we can look at an equity multiplier or how much money a, a asset is making but the ability for it to cover based on a one two five debt service coverage ratio is the maximum amount of leverage you can put on it so yeah. even if something's worth $10 million and you can borrow 70% of the purchase price, if the interest rates are above 8%, typically that, that number comes down to 60%. So there, there is a gap. That's what drives, even though in the market where you know the value is 10 million, replacement cost is 15 million, purchase price will often you know be six to 8 million. Right. right. And then when you're figuring out the purchase price, it's also critical to see how much you're going to put into that PIP, the property improvement plan, in order to get it in shape, in order to deliver those returns that you want. So how do you think about that in coordination with what you're trying to buy a property for? Yeah. So, you know, typically um, franchisors, you know, all of them that we've interacted with and all, all right. the professionals that we work with are, are very forthright and open. With, with what they want to see with an asset, depending on the age of it, timeline yeah. around it. You know, um, in our experience, we haven't had many surprises. I know that that has not always been the case when you do an acquisition. Right. So when we negotiate, you know, we're, we're in parallel, right? Where we're negotiating a purchase price while we're having conversations with the franchisors and we're trying to understand how much capital is going to be invested into the property. Typically for a hundred hotel keys, it's between two and five million. And a component of that, you know, will be refresh interiors, the technology side, and then the exterior. Um, and, and so coming coming to terms with our debt partners and the sellers to a, a, a agreeable price has been our, our strategic advantage, because I think the sellers that have to sell in this market don't have more than 12 months or 24 months. They've already right. postponed their pips long enough. And the franchisors are motivated to find institutional quality groups that are looking at the property as an asset, right? Interesting, right. Yes. And that really kind of frames where we are transitioning overall, particularly in the Indian American community, right? Um, because the first generation spent their time finding their place, figuring out that first business and raising all of you guys that are now, um, you know, taking over with a with with much more um, serious and sophisticated way because you've had the opportunity to learn from your parents and do the schooling and have that inside out understanding of uh, operations as well. So um, uh, Amit, one of the things that I find curious is I think the brands definitely have an understanding of what they want, but I also think you guys do as well. When you go in and you say, we're considering buying this, you probably already have four or five brands that you feel that you're probably circling around. I see Bob and uh, doing it sometimes because those brands are available in the area. Other times the bones dictate that. How do you see it? Yeah, we, we have a little bit of a sweet spot of what we kind of like our profile, what we go after. And we look at a lot of different factors, right? We look at particularly, we like to stay within the IEG Hilton Marriott select service or extended mm -hmm. world. Um, and we look at markets where they're a little bit more mature. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's at least more than 10 de de demand generators in the market. There's mm -hmm. barriers to entry. So we know there's no new supply coming to the market and then the age of the asset. Right. So how much capex are we going to put into this, whether it's not only the PIP, but also deferred maintenance, owner related stuff that we want to implement, whether it's technology like Bob had mentioned. But we really mm -hmm. want to go in and transform the hotel. And so we factor in all these things. And, and we kind of implement a, a strategy that really we believe that can can really benefit the hotel on the outcome of, after the PIP is completed and all the CapEx dollars are being put in. And the franchisees get really excited about that, right? Because we're entering right. um, we're entering some of these hotels like the Courtyards or the Hamptons, the Holiday Inn Expresses of the world or the Stay Bridges, their Homewoods. 
those are the type of assets that we like to go after because there's a lot of loyalty to those brands, right? Oh, From yeah. Standpoint, mm -hmm. it's the yeah. go-to for not only business, corporate leisure or group business, but also like you know, leisure, like sporting teams, right? That's a huge business today that uh. <laughs> we, we all want to tap into, right? And so right. we have a courtyard, a huge hockey team stayed this past weekend, right? and then we have a mm -hmm. long relationship with them. So we're right. just seeing a lot more of that type of business, and there's a lot of loyalty to brands that we got to make sure we upheld the standards in these hotels, right? And yeah. not just like cut costs from different corners, but really, really, really bring in an ideal, unique guest experience, right? That's important. You know, and, and you bring up something that I think is really, really important. There's a couple things I want to talk about that. When you say we're, we're making sure that we're building that loyalty, we're keeping that loyalty, and we're running the hotel the right way. First generation, find it, move you guys into the hotel, feed your family, run a business. Either one of you lived in the hotel when you were younger? Yes. We both grew up yeah, in the hotel. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, mean, I don't forget, you got to bring the cousins over too so they could open hotels. We, well, every single cousin that came from India owns yeah. a motel now, right? Yep. So, so that's my point. My point is, you use the, I tie that into barrier to entry. Once, and I smiled when Glenn said, kind of, uh, when you look at the hotel, when you look at like you guys know, it's like it's like you know, it's like as easy as putting your watch on. It's like that's the deal, that's the brand, that's what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. This is how much we're going to make. I'm on to my next deal. It's it's <laughs> over. It's done. It's like when you're doing this for as long as we've been doing this, you know it. Like I said, it's easy as putting your watch on. It's not. And when other people are saying challenging, you're like, all right, I I, I got to move on because this is done. So, but the barrier to entry is a very interesting conversation because. When people say, why can't I get in the business? Well, one, it's expensive. You can't get two cousins with 50 grand to open a restaurant. Hotels are much more expensive, number one. That, that's just the barrier right there. But then you have to know the codes. You have to know, well, yes, this will work, but then you have to deal with this. Like if you're, God forbid, you open one in New York City, you know you're going to deal with the fire codes and, the, the and, and the unions. And like it's just, that's a high barrier to entry, right? So, so, when you say barrier to entry, name the first three that gets you probably in the game faster than someone just starting in the game. Like, why can you jump those barriers to entry faster than they can? Good question. Go ahead. Well, I, I would say, like, for, for us, like, the dynamics of our team and the level of sophistication that we have, mm -hmm. and I we all kind of offset each other's skill sets that we can probably go into a market where we can be very successful. We have a great construction guy. We have a finance guy. We have a deal guy. We have Bob and capital raising investor relations side. So we all kind of come together when we look at deals and we look at, the, we look at a particular hotel. We just know that there's, there's a lot of upside value in us acquiring this hotel because there's a lot of different, we have, relationships with maybe major corporations in the market we already have a we have other hotels already in the in the market that will have a lot of efficiencies that we can put <clears> in. all those all those things we look at and we also know the franchisees are not there's no new supply coming in the market because we know we have relationships with the city right or with government officials right so all those things we look into we factor into like what is it really gonna how much value can we really bring above the baseline of what typical hotel ownership groups or management companies do, right? I think for us is that we look at all, all holistically, all different factors of it. Like we bought a Hampton in downtown Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have thought of it, but we, it's, it's an opportunity zone site. I mean, just think about that, right? That level right. of sophistication. And it requires a lot of, you know, uniqueness. So we brought in good partners that we have to help us enable to like be successful in that opportunity zone process, right? Just the value add that we're bringing into the building, into the downtown market, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of different things that I, I would say, like, that's unique to us as a team. Yeah, and you can't, you can't do it. Barrier, just barrier to entry, then. Barrier to entry. Yeah. And then, Anthony, yeah. to add on what Omid just said is, you know, like, we're all into our 15th, 18th, 20th year of business. Right. Right. Like, we, you know, we physically started, um, right, our early college years. So we've, we've done it. And we've been successful with other verticals, right? You know, for our from our side on the Green Harvest side, we started with multi we started started with a motel, graduated to multifamily apartments, really, you know, helped scale that side of the business. Um, and then we moved on to hospitality, right? And so Believable. having having form capital in, in multiple verticals, having um, you know, work with 
attorneys, cities, government officials to, you know, understand what the community's requirements are and adding value to that. You know, um, Ahmed's background is everything from renovations to constructions. And and then we, we all got to a point where we're like, okay, how can we complement each other's skill sets and, and, and how do we build a team? And I think if, if we had to give advice to somebody starting out, I think it would be in, in this manner, right? First, becoming a subject matter expert is probably the most important thing. And that takes time. It takes education and time. You must pick a lane and focus on it. If it's select service, if it's motels, if it's luxury, whatever it is that you know you, you have a keen interest in, follow that. Second, find individuals that you can align your, you know, your, your like-mindedness, your principles with, your, your intentions with, that have different skill sets than you, right? If you if you mirror the person that you're gonna partner with, it's probably not a good partnership, right? If you have agreements on every decision you make, it's probably not a good partnership. We adamantly disagree, probably on every decision we make. We all That's think cool. to do it. But yeah. at the end of it, our, our common intention and purpose, we right. wanna build a lasting business, right? We wanna do it together, we wanna do it the right way. And I think that's what gives us a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anthony, you muted yourself and it looked like you muted yourself. <clears throat> yeah, just an expert in the field is so critically important. You know, I've seen so many what I've done, what I've done over my career and then going into Hotel Impossible. I can't tell you how many people that have owned Dunkin' Donuts or owned, um, you know, car washes or 7-Elevens or restaurants. And they're like, they see a deal. Well, there was one deal that comes to mind. It was a $50 million deal. The guy lost the financing. It, it crumbled in, I think, five years of sitting there. And they picked it up for $2 million. Now, every other hotelier in that area ran from it. Now, very sophisticated hoteliers because they knew that $2 million would cost them $35 million to get that thing op open and running. And that area couldn't afford a $35 million water park for a number of reasons. And but somebody saw that it's like, oh, my, look at me. Look how lucky I am. You know, it's like buying a Porsche and you don't open the hood and there's no engine. in. Well, nobody yeah. else it because there's no engine. Right. There's, it's a battery no, battery. There's, there's no engine. And I think that that's, you know, it's having the knowledge. It's like it comes second nature. Remember, I'm going to ask you a question when you were talking. It, it popped in my mind. What is the quickest it took you to make a decision on buying a hotel, meaning you see the hotel and you're literally calling someone to transfer. To transfer the I, have my, I have my number. I want to know your number. What was the fastest? For, for, so there, there, there's five of us. For me, it's yeah. 30 seconds. I, I, yeah. you know, I see it. I'm like, I know it. It's going to work out. We're going to figure how it out. How how many, before you walk in or after you, how many minutes you before you I mean, I, you can feel it, right? Um, and and, and our, our, our finance partner would tell you three to six months. Three to six months. No, but you're literally saying transfer the money. Yeah, I listen. I would, you know, again, this is why you have partners, uh, because like again, not not always is that a good approach. But you know, usually, you know, when, when you look at an asset and, and you look at enough assets, right? We look at a certain age, 1998 mm -hmm. to 2018, 100 to 150 hotel keys, right? Hilton, Hilton product, Marriott products. You look at the market. You look at the demographics, per capita income, median household incomes. You look at demand drivers, you look at who the owner is. More often than not, if it's an institutional owner in the Midwest and, and we see that top line and we see like massive expense structures, like multiple layers of expenses that we don't even know how the heck they put in there, we know that's a winner because that 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 asset, nobody is particularly asset focused, they're very much fund focused, right? Right. So mm -hmm. it, it is one odd, you know, and you know the one out of 10 have fallen through the cracks, right? And so when we see it, we're very much adamant to get it done. Now, we have a very thorough process. Like it takes us anywhere from two months to a year to get a deal closed, right? So there's a lot of due diligence that we go into it, but that initial feeling is there. Yeah, but how? But it takes you how long to lock it up because you got to lock it up. So how long does it take you? I got to get that deal and you lock it up. It depends on the deal. I mean, you know, uh, we, we sent a, a seven-figure non-refundable wire to lock up a, a sub $10 million deal because it's in our market. We knew what it was, and we, we knew it was hard money, non-refundable, but we knew that we could get it done. I right? was in the room where somebody gave a $5 million check non-refundable in one breakfast. He didn't even finish his eggs. And he goes, I know somebody else is looking at this. 
there's five million non refund. You know all the names involved. I gave you the names, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Five yeah. million dollars in cash, a ride to the airport, sealed the deal. And literally within minutes, I was in my office having to do due diligence. And if wow. in 24 hours they didn't close, they, they didn't transfer more money, the guy lost five million dollars. Wow. Yeah. Woo. Uh, that's insane. Uh, before we wrap, before we wrap up today, um, the Fed's indicated that they're going to be lowering interest rates throughout the year. How does that inform your immediate decision making and your plans throughout the year to acquire some assets? So I'll, I'll take this first, and then Amit can chime in. You know, for from our perspective, market conditions for twenty four are very similar to twenty three. Even though the Fed speak is that interest rates are eventually going to loosen. Um, we've seen a, a few more um, lenders come to market, but again, the lending environment is very tight. So our, our underwriting has not changed. We still forecast very similar conditions to 23. We're also, you know, in the early stages of forming our first actual fund, um, mm -hmm. you know, about $150 million fund to actually acquire hotels starting June of this year, all the way through July of next year, because we see the opportunity in the market that we saw in 23 continue into 25. Hmm. Right. And basically a, a fund for people that don't know, basically the money's there and you look at the deal, you do your due diligence and you move the money and you can move quicker and you basically you can get in and out uh, quicker. So um, I remember the first my first introduction to a fund um, was a lot going on <laughs> and th there's a and there's a lot of pressure. On that yep. fund, you don't get you don't get fund two if fund one one does not work out so well. Right, you can't hold, and you got to get that money deployed. And I'm um, in the industry here about all this money sitting on the sidelines. This is a great example of having this money, and you got to get it out to the market as quick as possible. Amit, what's your approach and thought about this? Yeah, I think this. I think I think I go back to the relationships that we've built in 20 last year, and we go back mm -hmm. to some of those folks, hotel groups, institution groups, management companies that do have solid deal flow that need to mm -hmm. exit. And I think we would we would like to scoop up a lot of those opportunities that fit our profile again um, with this fund, right? And that I think we see a very similar kind of picture like what Bobin said, mm -hmm. but I think also on top of that, we've created a lot, a lot more banking relationships last year, right? So that we would go back to our debt partners and really say, look, here's our plan. We're gonna do what we did last year, but maybe even more, right? And so, I think for us, it's it's ninety percent focus on acquisitions and ten percent, ten fifteen percent maybe focus on you know development projects that we've been looking at too. Right, that's uh, awesome. So you you gentlemen going to be at uh, Alice next week? Unfortunately, we can't. We'll be at Hunter. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll be at I'll be. We had other meet, we had other meetings scheduled, so we're we're you know we're in other parts of the corner right now. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. It's a uh, it's a very productive but exhausting uh, event. Uh, that's for sure. Um, we'll be out there in LA uh, next week doing some uh, doing some coverage for sure. Any uh, any final words that you gentlemen uh, have with us today, Amit? You want to start? No, I think for us, we we were we're I think we're what we did last year was probably pretty impressive uh, from from the hospitality world because of mm -hmm. where the debt markets were. You know, there's very few transactions that occurred. Yeah. And we did quite a bit. I think the momentum is there for us. We have an, a solid investor base that supports us. Uh, we have franchise relationships, banking relationships. We've created all these institutional fund relationships. And I think we're really excited what's coming in the near future for us. Hey, Bob, is it a more favorable environment for you when there's less overall development and purchasing of properties or when everybody's at it at once? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's like uh, Warren Buffett's quote, you know, be, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. Right. And I think uh, for us, that's that that really rings true right now. I think we've, we've done a lot of, you know, work to be prepared for this moment. We hope to take advantage of it over the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah. People, and I'll, who people win in these environments. People who are nimble win in these environments. Uh, hey, Anthony, we started saying it in 2021. The people that were making the deals then were going to be the heroes of the coming cycle. And we're seeing yeah. all of that stuff come to bear on a different just on media like we, we were the first ones up like during covid we were the first ones up live literally 24 right. hours we were up and we got everybody if we were number two and number three we would be chasing somebody else so we were just like yeah let's do it click what are we gonna talk about i don't know what are we gonna talk about we, we literally said that on air we were, uh, uh, so i think sometimes you just jump when you know you need to jump and it works out Thank you very much for having us, gentlemen. You know, we're we're very appreciative of this. And no, thank you. We love your, we, we love your show and you know, 
look forward to continuing to have conversations. Right. Yeah, hey, uh, Bob, and honestly, I'd love to have you guys back on like six, seven months from now. I'd love to hear how it's going, get an update on the fund. Right. I thought that this was uh, really educational for us and for our audience. So, Amit, Bob, and thank you so much for being here, yes. gentlemen. Thank you. Really, really thank appreciate you. it. All right, be sure to follow us on uh, all the social medias. And if you're watching us, why not download the audio version? Go wherever you get it, wherever you get your podcasts. We are there waiting to be downloaded. And if you're listening to us, why not watch us? Give it a shot on uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, NoVacancyNews.com is where you can find all the shows. Thanks so much for being here, guys. We'll be back tomorrow. And remember, we've got one life, so blaze on. And eh? be kind to yourself. Bye.